Good morning to everybody in the room and everybody who's uh, watching us uh, online. Uh, I'm Alice Rivlin. I'm a senior fellow here at the uh, Brookings Institution. And I'm delighted to be chairing uh, this panel, which will take us uh, more deeply into what is going on in particular states. Dick Nathan, who has been mentioned as the sort of father of this kind of field research, uh, Dick recognized when the Affordable Care Act passed that this was going to be a huge opportunity uh, to observe a national experiment, an experiment in expanding health insurance uh, coverage uh, to a large group of uninsured people, and in a novel way. Uh, the expansion of Medicaid was not novel, but what was novel was creation of these exchanges or marketplaces uh, on which people could go and look for what options they had for buying health insurance and also uh, what subsidies they would get under the new act and what it would cost them uh, to buy health insurance, a very uh, modern and interesting idea. But the states are very different in this country, in case you haven't noticed, uh, and uh, insurance regulation uh, is a state function. The uh, federal government has not been a regulator uh, of insurance. So it was clear that this law uh, was going to play out very differently uh, in different states, uh, both because the states had options. Uh, they could expand Medicaid or not. They could run their own exchange or rely on the feds. And because they're very different and they have different histories uh, of how they have handled um, health insurance. Uh, so this was an opportunity, and uh, Dick had the wisdom to see we ought to seize this and set up a network of experts uh, in as many states as possible uh, and get them feeding back information about how uh, this experiment uh, was working. And uh, this project is uh, uh, one of uh, several uh, uh, that have benefited from uh, that uh, insight. Mark has given us the overview, uh, and now we're going to get a chance uh, to look at four estates in some detail. We couldn't have had 10 people up here. It's too many. They wouldn't fit. Uh, and you don't want to listen to that many people anyway. Uh, so uh, we selected uh, four states that were quite different in uh, a number of dimensions. Uh, we're going to talk first about Colorado, uh, and we're lucky to have Louise Norris. Uh, Louise is a healthcare writer, and she also sells insurance, uh, <laughs> which is, a, she's been on the ground. She knows how to do this stuff. Uh, but she writes about it uh, very uh, lucidly in a number of uh, national uh, publications. But in this case, uh, she was uh, our expert on the ground in Colorado. Uh, we will hear uh, next uh, from uh, Brad Wright. Uh, Brad is a professor in two departments uh, at uh, the University of Iowa. Uh, both health management uh, and public policy, and has a long history of uh, publications writing about health insurance. Uh, and Brad's going to talk to us about Iowa, um, which is actually a less happy story than Colorado. So we didn't put him didn't put him first. Uh, and uh, th then we have uh, Lynn Blewett, uh, who is going to talk to us about Minnesota. Uh, she did the, uh, the field research on Minnesota. Lynn uh, is a professor of health policy at the University of Minnesota uh, in the School of Public Health. Uh, and uh, she has also uh, published uh, widely uh, about uh, all sorts of health insurance matters and been on the front lines, uh, both in Minnesota and here in Washington, uh, as uh, health uh, coverage expanded. 
And finally, we will hear from Mark Hall, who uh, has uh, already been introduced. But the remarkable thing about Mark at this moment is, although he hangs out uh, at Wake Forest, where he's a professor of uh, law uh, and uh, public health, um, he's going to talk to us about Arizona. Uh, <laughs> we thought we needed a fourth state, and he had worked on all of them. Uh, so uh, let's go to Louise first. Good morning. Um, so Colorado, we have a pretty stable market. Um, we did have some significant rate increases this year, but we have seven insurers in our exchange, and that is the same as we had last year. Um, and enrollment was slightly higher for 2018 than it was in 2017. So I just briefly wanted to talk about what Colorado has done both long-term and more recently to facilitate that market stability. So the Colorado does have a hands-on proactive approach to healthcare reform, and that ha has been long-term. Um, before the ACA required uh, like maternity coverage um, and banned gender rating, uh, Colorado had already done that via state legislation. Um, for many, many years, Colorado has limited short-term plans uh, to no more than six months, non-renewable, and you can't get a short-term plan if you've had more than one in the previous 12 months. So kind of preventing people from stringing together a series of short-term plans um, to substitute for regular health insurance. Um, as soon as the ACA was implemented, Colorado went ahead and expanded Medicaid, um, set up a state-run exchange, um, they also terminated grandmothered plans, transitional plans, after just two years. Um, so we did allow short or grandmother plans to continue in 2014 and 2015, but then cut them off at that point. And there were about 75,000 people on those plans at that point who had to, if they wanted to remain insured, they had to switch to the ACA-compliant market. Um, at this point now in 2018, there are still about 30 states that have that are still allowing their transitional plans to continue and to continue all the way into 2019. So cutting off those plans early was part of Colorado's strategy to stabilize the market. Um, for this year, for 2018, if we look back to 2017, what was going on, um, obviously last summer there was a lot of justifiable concern on the part of insurance carriers over what was going on at the federal level. and. I think Colorado, our division of insurance, really took a proactive stance to reassure the insurance companies that, hey, you know, we know there's a lot of uncertainty at the federal level, but we're going to do whatever we can to implement regulations and communicate effectively so that you know that at the state level we're doing everything we can. And so they really worked with the insurers all summer last year to, to keep them in the market. And as Mark mentioned, Colorado was one of the few states that did not do the silver loading for CSRs, but it, instead they broad loaded. They had the insurers add it to all the plans. But that was part of their strategy was to communicate that early to the insurers. They were getting this information out to the insurance companies like in May and June last year. I mean, we had some states where silver loading was happening, but it was happening in October. And so what Colorado regulators wanted to do was make sure that the insurance companies knew back when it was still just very uncertain what was going to happen, hey, we have a strategy for you. You can go ahead and add the cost of CSR, add it to all your plans because they weren't sure at that point whether CMS would allow them to just add it to silver plans and they didn't want to leave the insurers hanging if that ended up being the case in October. But so even though it was a broad load, which we know now doesn't, help consumers as much as this overload, it definitely helped us to stabilize our market because it gave the insurers, you know, they knew there was a strategy. And then Colorado was also very early out of the gates in terms of announcing that they would extend open enrollment for 2018. They kept it all the way through almost mid-January. Um, and our enrollment did end up slightly higher in 2018 than it had been in 2017. Um, so. If, you, if we're looking at 2019 now, our rates are actually, um, rate filings are being published today um, in Colorado, and our insurance commissioner has said that the rate filings indicate a stable market um, for going for 2019. Now, the risk adjustment, or, you know, the risk uh, adjustment issue could be, a, could be an issue with that, but for right now, for what we have, the rate filings, it does look stable. 
Um, and we are switching to a silver loading strategy for 2019, which will further stabilize the market because premium subsidies will go up. Um, people who don't get subsidies will find their bronze plans and their gold plans are, are maybe potentially even less expensive than they were this year. Um, so it's, you know, things are looking pretty good, but I don't want to paint the picture that it's all just sunshine and roses in Colorado because there are still issues with affordability for people who don't get premium subsidies. Um, and we have, we are a purple state, so we have a um, Democratic majority in our House, a Republican majority in our Senate. And so there were additional measures that were considered uh, this year during the legislative session. Um, lawmakers in the House passed a bill that would have directed the state to submit a 1332 waiver for reinsurance and another bill that would have created a state-based subsidy for people who earn between 400 and 500 percent of the poverty level. And that second bill was actually considered in 2017 as well. It's the second time we've gone through this. Um, both of those bills passed the House, did not pass the Senate. Um, and there was, when I've talked with, with lawmakers and the Division of Insurance, there's a general reluctance to commit funding to help people who earn more than 400 percent of the poverty level because there's sort of a there's this feeling that these people, don't, they're already well enough off that they don't need help. But if you look at what they're actually paying for their health insurance, if you're earning just a little bit over 400% of the poverty level and you live, Colorado has some very disparate rating areas. We have some very expensive areas. If you're a little over 400% of the poverty level and you live in one of those expensive areas, and particularly if you're older, we, have, we see lots of people who have to spend in excess of 35% of their income on health insurance if they want to buy ACA compliant coverage. So this is still the issue of, although we have a pretty stable market, um, the issue of affordability for people who don't get premium subsidies is certainly still an issue. And ideally it would be addressed on the federal level, but I think you'll continue to see Colorado trying to address it on the state level um, as we move forward. So that's me. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Brad, tell us about Iowa. All right. Um, so it's fun to talk about Iowa in a non-presidential election year to have this much attention focused on us. Um, granted, as Alice kind of already alluded to, um, I'm here sharing um, what I would call bad news, um, not, not great news. Um, so for a while, people have been asking the question of what's going on with Iowa um, with regard to the marketplace. And I, th I think one of the, the most noteworthy kind of notorious stories out there is when Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield made their disclosure and one might say possible HIPAA violation about the, um, the young man um, in Iowa who has this rare form of hemophilia and was costing them a million dollars a month in claims. And that's a great story that gets headlines. Um, that's not really the story of, of what's wrong with Iowa. It's far less sensational than that. Um, and it really comes down um, to uh, the fact that Iowa's marketplace has been unstable from the, the beginning. Um, there were, I think it was four um, different insurers that participated in our marketplace at the start. Um, but you may remember our co-op, Co-Opportunity Health, which was the first co-op to go under. Uh, in the country, so we have that distinction. Um, fortunately, we're not alone. Pretty much all the rest of them folded up shortly thereafter, but we were liquidated. Um, Co-Opportunity Health was liquidated that first year. Um, and a small part of the story of what's wrong with Iowa is uh, geography. Um, so as a rural state, there are issues. Mark talked a little bit about the problems of, of um, smaller rating areas, and so insurers hesitating to go into those areas. Um, also, their ability to negotiate with providers. So if there's only one community hospital within reasonable driving distance, it makes it pretty difficult to exclude that hospital from your network. Um, so that th those two things kind of combine and drive up um, prices because insurers aren't able to negotiate lower um, reimbursement rates. But that's really a small part of the story. The bigger part of the story, I think, gets into what you wanted to call it socio-political um, and political science type issues. So I think it's a politics story. Um, so our then governor, Terry Branstad, who's now our ambassador to China, um, was an opponent um, 
of, of the ACA. And um, so the short version is he essentially deliberately underinvested in outreach and enrollment efforts. We are one of the federally run exchanges, and so that lines up with the data that you've already seen. Um, and so the, the um, enrollment of individuals eligible for our marketplace in Iowa is actually the lowest of any state in the country, uh, just 20%. Um, I think that figure is from 2016 um, from the Kaiser Family Foundation. So that's part of it. And then the, the flip side of that, um, a, a very related issue, is that we have a really high number of individuals in these non-compliant plans, these grandfathered plans and, and grandmothered or transitional plans. Um, so whereas the national average for, for that, for people that are purchasing coverage on the individual market, sits at around 9%. Um, in Iowa, that number is between 50 and 60%. So we have many more individuals covered that way um, than have ever actually even been enrolled in our marketplace. So we have this segmentation of the market in, the, in that way. Um, and all of those individuals, for the most part, are insured by Wellmark, um, which is our dominant insurer. And it's worth noting that Wellmark sat out of the exchange in 2014, 15, and 16, dipped their toes in the water in 2017, is back out in 2018, and is now talking about going back in in 2019. And I'll talk about um, what I think that maybe is about and, um, towards the end of my remarks. So these kind of broad dynamics have set up what faintly resembles, although again, technically is not a death spiral. Um, it has certainly driven healthier individuals, especially those who are not getting the subsidies to leave the marketplace. Um, and it's also driven insurers to leave. So we've had, I think, a total of nine insurers that have participated in our marketplace at some point since 2014 that have since left. And it, as you know, um, it looked like we were going to have no insurers at all this year um, before Medica stepped up and said, we'll, we'll take on the, the job of insuring folks in the marketplace in Iowa. Um, but we'll do that by hiking premiums 57%. Um, so it's a good job if you can get it, right? Because you don't have any competition. Um, and you can set the prices where you need them to be to ensure that you make money. So one of the people actually that I spoke with, who I won't name, uh, when I was doing this research said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Medica brings in 60 to $120 million this year. Um, so again, a good business model. Um, as all of that was unfolding, and it was looking like we might be a, a bear market, um, we pursued a 1332 waiver to do what was known as the Iowa stopgap measure. And that was going to do essentially two things. Um, one was reinsurance, right? So we were looking at what Minnesota and Oklahoma and others were, were talking about at that time uh, and, and saying, we'll do that too. But we're also going to get rid of our marketplace because what we want to do is establish um, an off exchange purchase of insurance. And it's going to be just one type of plan. Any insurer that wants to participate in this, um, for lack of a better word, scheme um, can, can do so. But this is the one type of plan they can offer. The rationale behind that being we're not going to have a lot of time between getting approval of this and the open enrollment period. So we want to streamline that process as much as possible. Um, and the reason that it goes off exchange is because they wanted to change from the subsidy model to a um, sort of a premium credit model, um, which would be available to any islands. Um, so it doesn't top out at 400%, um, but it, it is adjusted for age and income. Um, pretty much anyone that was following this said this doesn't meet the, the guardrail provisions of section 1332 of the ACA. So we were wondering, you know, if this gets approved, are we then going to be set up for battles in the courts and so on? Um, and unfortunately, we, we don't get to know the answer to that um, because Iowa withdrew its application. And the story there, I've heard mixed reports. So from folks in the state, it was um, CMS informed them that basically if this worked um, and if enrollment uh, started to increase in the marketplace, they weren't going to get any additional federal dollars. So I was going to have to pick up all of that um, excess cost, and they weren't willing to do that. Um, and so they withdrew their waiver. That's the story they tell. Other stories that were in the news were that um, President Trump actually went and talked with Seema Verma and said, don't approve this waiver because this is all unfolding at the time that the Senate was talking about repealing the ACA. And so could maybe this be a way to further sabotage the struggles that Iowa was going through to begin with? Um, I don't know, but what I do know is that um, Iowa has had roughly double, if we're speaking in proportional terms, the cuts to outreach and enrollment dollars 
um, from the federal government that other states have experienced. And of course, we've had more cuts announced this week. Um, so we do seem to be getting picked on a little bit in that respect. Um, but the upshot here is that Iowa has a terribly segmented market. Um, and, and Mark talked about this a lot, about that subsidy cliff. Um, so the Iowa Insurance Division has actually put out some numbers on this. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple that's uh, age 55 that lives in Iowa City, where I currently reside, um, who's earning $64,798 a year. So that puts them at 399% of poverty. Um, because their premiums are capped by the affordability provision uh, at 9.69% of income, they pay $523 a month. Um, if you bump that up, if they earn an additional $324, um, so that brings it to $65,122 a year, and now that puts them at 401% of poverty. Now there's no premium cap to protect them. Um, their premiums would go to $2,724 a month, and that's approximately 50% of their household income for the year. Um, so obviously that's a problem. It's especially a problem in a place like Iowa um, where we have um, farmers who have variable incomes. That was something that a lot of people talked about and how they want to handle that so that they don't get these surprises come tax time. Um, an obvious fix would be for insurers to discontinue their grandfathered plans, um, for the Iowa Insurance Commissioner to say no more transitional plans. There was a, an analysis from the Wakeley Consulting Group that basically said if you do that, your enrollment will go up between fifty-five and $85,000, uh, excuse me, persons, and the, the premiums will decrease uh, 8 to 18 percent. So that's not a, a total fix, but it'd be a step in the right direction. Um, and unfortunately, what we're likely to see um, is going to exacerbate the issues rather than ameliorate them. Um, so the most recent development in Iowa is the passage of a law um, to allow Farm Bureau to sell health plans that are not considered health insurance. Um, and so that stands to, uh, if you pay $55, right, and become a member of Farm Bureau, you get access to these plans that are going to be cheaper because they're not as robust of an insurance product, bottom line. Um, so that may be great for these individuals that are out here above 400% of poverty and not subsidized. Um, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you what will happen to maybe some of the younger and healthier people who are in the subsidized market and maybe want to move to an even cheaper plan. Um, but that's kind of where we're headed. And um, just to finish up as I'm over time, um, Wellmark has, um, has said it's going back into the marketplace in 2019. So it's partnering with Farm Bureau <coughs> to offer these plans. And I think what that suggests to me is they're actually now figuring out, they being Wellmark, how to play to both the subsidized and the unsubsidized market. Right? So they can potentially end their transitional plans, and for the group that would be qualified for subsidies, they can pursue them there in the marketplace. Um, but for other individuals who um, are in, in better shape, you know, healthier, younger, um, maybe not subsidized, they can go after them through these farm bureau plans. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. I think we just heard the sequel, What's the Matter with Iowa? <laughs> uh, Lynn, tell us about Minnesota. Okay, we'll try, we'll try to do this in 10 minutes. <laughs> so Minnesota, um, like other states, has, a, has had a very volatile individual market. Um, we're very small market, so we started, when we, when we started with the ACA implementation, we had about 300,000 people. That has um, diminished to about 160,000, so we've lost a lot. And, and it's just, it's, it's unique um, states, states who are smaller, you know, so we have, and rural. So we have 300,000 people compared to, you know, 1.5 million in California's individual market. So it creates like a different dynamic. It's a smaller number, smaller problems, but also very volatile and not enough of a, not enough numbers to spread risk. So it becomes a really important, you know, it's very important to think about Minnesota and Iowa's and others that are very small, very rural. We also had one of the largest um, high-risk pools in the country, 26,000 people. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you think of our, our individual market as 300,000, now 130,000 people is a lot of people. So that transitioned into our individual market, um, which you know has played a part in, in the discussions of what's going on and contributed to the volatility and the risk profile of the market. 
We also have a basic health plan in Minnesota. So that's the ACA option. New York and Minnesota has, has a BHP, which is between 138 and 200% of the federal poverty level. So that we, that's funded by the um, federal government primarily through 95% of what would have gotten in the individual market. So what their APTC, 95% of what their premium tax credit would be. So that's financing the, um, the BHP. That's about 80,000 people. That's not in the risk pool for the individual market. So again, you can see how this gets complex very quickly, even with a small market. The BHP also creates very strange incentives because the financing is based on the premiums because the APTC are based on the premiums. So as the premiums go up, we get more money from the federal government for our BHP. So stabilizing premiums gives us less money for BHP. So people who want <laughs> funding for low-income populations, you know, go ahead, raise the premiums in the individual market. Let's get that federal subsidy in if you're doing a federal maximizing strategy. So it creates really weird incentives. That's like not good public policy for all you young people. <laughs> I mean, it's just the con. You know, it's it's in contrast to to two different opposing um, incentives there. Um, because we have the PH, BHP, the CSR, so the cost sharing reductions was not a particular big issue for Minnesota. So, because 138 to 200 percent are covered under our basic health plan program, there's no there's no there's no copays or deductibles. We don't get CSRs for those. So when, when other states were worried about the CSR reductions, we just, it wasn't, it's not an issue for Minnesota. Only about 13% of people in the um, QHP market got CSRs. Um, Minnesota also has a very active regulatory and legislative environment and has for many years. We're, we're very proactive in terms of, um, you know, I guess right now we're not keeping ahead of changes, but we're reacting to changes. And so over the last couple of years, the legislature and the insurance department have been very active in terms of, you know, okay, what, what changed? What can we do to ameliorate and get people covered basically and get affordable coverage to people? So um, we started with some of the lowest rates in the country and had to play catch up. So in 2017, the premiums in the individual market increased between 50 to 60%. So this was a huge shock to everybody because um, we just hadn't had those levels of rate increases. Now, the sub subsidized market was fine because they received subsidies from the federal government, but those outside above 400% really faced the increase directly with no subsidy. <coughs> So in 2017, um, the legislature passed a rebate program to allow for a 25% rebate based on for those above 400% of the individual market. So that was sort of a quick fix. Um, both Republicans and Democrats agreed, and the governor signed it. And um, that was, you know, a, an opportunity to help people above 400%. That was just a one-time deal. They allocated general fund money to support it. The problem was it wasn't passed in time. It was right at the end of open enrollment, so the take-up wasn't as great as it could have been. But there's also the precedent of talking about a rebate as an option, a state-funded rebate or tax credit for those above 400%. Um, along with that legislation, um, we have Republicans on the... Um, on the Senate and the House side, they added who added in to allow for-profit health plans in Minnesota. So one thing unique about Minnesota, we've been a very closed market and have not allowed for-profits. We're the only um, state in the union that has had that regulation. So all our all our health plans are non-for-profit. So we now allow for-profit plans, and that has not been an issue yet. But United is certainly um, poking around, and so is. Um, is Aetna. And so we anticipate that that's going to have another change in impact. And that was a part of the package with the rebate, and, and um, that was an agreement between Republicans and Democrats to let that go. And then we also provided for um, egg co-ops, so agriculture co-ops, so tied to the agriculture industry, so um, to allow for agriculture co-ops, which are still insurance, but they're more like a self-insured product. So, um, so they still are, you know, tr traditional insurance products with a premium. Um, Land O'Lakes has one, and then there's another one, and they're marketed around 
you know, the healthier parts of the state, I'll have to say. But um, they, they did get some take up, not a lot, about 1,000, 1,500 people. So that's, again, it's like, you know, strategies to get people affordable coverage. Um, the reinsurance, so, so that passed in 2017, those activities. And then the legislature authorized the um, departments to go ahead and apply for a reinsurance um, a reinsurance um, waiver, a 1332 waiver. So we, uh, that was approved in the fall. It's uh, 50,000 to 250,000 um, corridor with the 80-20 coinsurance, and that went into effect for 2018 rates. It came out very late, um, late August, and so the rate filings were with, the rate filings in, across the country were like with CSRs or out CSRs. In Minnesota, it was with reinsurance, without reinsurance. So that's how the rates were filed. Um, we, we did achieve our, you know, that was approved, um, which allowed the pass-through funding for, um, to fund the reinsurance, and the state contributed um, a portion to fund the reinsurance. That had an effect of decreasing um, the rates by about, decreasing the increase in the rates <laughs> by about 20%, um, and had, had, a, had an impact on the market. And I think, um, I think it also demonstrated, one of the things we learned talking to the insurance companies was that it demonstrated the state was willing to work with the insurance companies and to figure out solutions. Um, and so it, 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 again, it's this, it's this um, I guess, uh, active regulatory and legislative infrastructure that could, could work as a community and sort of public-private partnership to figure out what are we going to do and then actually doing, um, passing legislation. So the, um, we feel, so with the approval of our reinsurance, we also ask, because um, so the BHP funding that we get with APCTs for our, for our funding, we asked for the pass-through for that to continue. So when the premiums went down, we lost a significant amount of funding for our BHP. And so we asked for our reinsurance that that pass-through money for our BHP funding be continued. And um, that was not approved. And um, that was a significant blow to, um, and our governor in a letter called it nightmarish, because we gained federal financing for reinsurance but we lost a significant amount in our BHP financing. And again, it's that weird dynamic of the incentives not being aligned. So we got money for what, what the advocates will say, we got money to, to subsidize the insurance companies, but we lost money to subsidize pro programs for low-income populations. Um, but that's, it was too late in the process to change anything in, the, in legislation, or we just, we were stuck with it, basically. Um, but it was a significant amount, I think $150 million for Minnesota, that's a lot of money. Um, so the other thing that's going on is our, so most reinsurance is financed by a, most of the 1332 reinsurance waivers are financed by an assessment on insurance. That's typically how reinsurance is financed. In Minnesota, we used a state-designated fund that um, is called our Healthcare Access Fund. It's financed through a provider tax. That was also very controversial. So that's a that's a um, a tax that was used to support our state-funded programs, Minnesota Care, and because we have our federal funding financing the basic health plan, that we haven't had to use that money. So it's like piling up. And when the legislature are doing their things, they see a big pot of money. <laughs> it's like, oh, we can take that and use that. So that's what was used to finance reinsurance. So we only financed it for two years. Again, that's a 2% provider tax that's funding reinsurance for the state. So again, this is going to come up in the next legislative session of, um, is that appropriate use of state dollars? Is there a better way to finance it? We'll probably be talking again about a rebate, or um, there was a proposal introduced last bipartisan to do a tax credit, so like a state APCT, but we wouldn't do an advanced premium tax credit. It would likely be a tax credit through the tax code that would be state financed. Now that's assuming we have um, state money, and that provider tax is expected to expire, well, it's expiring at the end of 2019. So if that, if we don't have that resource, um, you know, I, I think a lot of, I think we will be very limited in what we can do and, and we will not be as proactive. Um, and that leads me to the midterm election. So a lot depends on um, what happens. We have a governor's race and um, 
Governor, our previous governor, Tim Pawlenty, has re-entered from the Republican side and um, very contentious and we're, a to we're considered a toss-up state. Um, so it really depends what happens um, in this, in this, um, in the, in the um, midterms. And um, I guess just to conclude with is, even in, even in Minnesota, with our collaborative approach and our history of working public-private partnership, there's still, um, there's increasing divisions between the Republicans and the Democrats. And I'm hoping as a, as a Minnesotan <laughs> that that is short-lived and kind of move back toward a more collaborative approach. I think there, there is, um, there's sort of pressures from both sides um, to, to, to sort of go into your own camp and not to talk to each other and um, and work you know work at opposite ends. Um, I think we we've, we've shown that we can be um, active and um, proactive in terms of uh, reacting to the changes. And and I think the insurance companies have one of the things they said is we could be stable if they'd stop changing the rules. So it's like every every few months something changes, and so I, I think everybody's waiting for things to just settle down and let's figure out how we can move forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. It is reassuring to hear about a place where Republicans and Democrats have worked together and said, uh, we got a problem, how do we solve it? Uh, would that it would happen here. Uh, Mark, tell us about Arizona. All right. and so. Uh, why me about Arizona? I, I just thought of one of the more interesting states that uh, couldn't be here today. But I, I did used to live in Arizona. My both my kids were born there, and I, I started my teaching career there. So I have a little bit of uh, credentials. But still, uh, everything I, I bring to you is uh, you know learned from our, our uh, field researcher there. Um, so um, Arizona has some uh, similarities to Iowa. Uh, also, uh, a pretty deep red state that. Uh, was pretty hostile uh, through the governor uh, to uh, Obamacare, but they did expand uh, Medicaid, uh, as Iowa did, uh, um, and um, they also had a lot of uh, grandfathered and, and um, uh, transitional plans in place. So, sort of the, that lay of the land, I'll just sort of state, but uh, things have uh, varied a lot from uh, year to year in Arizona in interesting ways that I, I'll, I'll briefly describe. Uh, starting out, Arizona had some of the lowest uh, rates in the country, uh, you know, quite, quite a bit lower than the national averages. And they had uh, a lot of insurer uh, competition. There was seven or eight insurers right from the get-go across the state. I mean, uh, certainly in the, in the major metropolitan areas, which would be Phoenix and Tucson, um, you, you know, you had the, the most insurers. But there was f four to five or whatever, even in the rural areas. Um, and, uh, and, and that was really uh, quite impressive and, and, and part of what helped uh, keep rates so low. Of course, they were too low. Um, and so the co-op there also failed uh, and failed sort of catastrophically. The first year, the co-op uh, priced way too high. It was uh, 40 to 50 percent above the market and got, by some accounts, fewer than 1,000 enrollees. And of course, the co-op's only business market is the ACA. <laughs> so they were desperate in year two. Uh, and they came in with uh, huge rate reductions, not just held their rates, but they reduced their rates quite a bit from what they had been, such that they now came in 40, 40 to 50 percent below the market. Um, well, of course, this caused a huge swing in enrollment. So, uh, you know, most people had been with the Blue Cross plan. Um, once you looked at your options, um, um, and and um, uh, one of the issues is with prices that low, the subsidies weren't as attractive, and so. When you had a lowballing insurer, I hate to use the word lowballing because it seems uh, pejorative in terms of, of, of a purposeful uh, business strategy, but an insurer, through for whatever reason, that ends up being much lower than, than the rest of the market, and they have a couple of different products out there. If that sets the the uh, the target premium uh, for the uh, subsidies, then that makes all the other coverage a lot more expensive, which leads to the the big enrollment swing. And so they had this big enrollment swing, but it wasn't sustainable. So by year three, they had to actually leave the market. They were declared, they were put in receivership and, and, and such. So meanwhile, uh, the other thing that happened is that uh, the market had started out with the traditional PPO plans that uh, uh, Blue Cross and Aetna and United and others um, had developed for their group market. Um, but 
uh, some other insurers had entered uh, or established themselves in the market based on fairly narrow networks around uh, 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 provider um, systems, uh, particularly in Phoenix and Tucson area. So in, in Arizona, you have a uh, good uh, level of competition uh, among several different uh, hospital-based uh, healthcare systems in, in Phoenix and, 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 and to a lesser extent in, in Tucson. But products that formed around those uh, competing systems and uh, uh, could offer prices um, on a narrow network basis that were considerably uh, favorable to the traditional broad PPO network. So quickly over the space of uh, a year, all the PPO plans dropped out and it was just HMO plans, which then caused further um, uh, movement of enrollees. So someone had a Blue Cross or whatever PPO had to decide where do I go? And so they look to say, do I go to the, to, to the Blue Cross HMO or do I switch over to the, uh, it was um, HealthNet, uh, uh, now owned by Centene, uh, that received a lot of enrollment. Uh, so that caused further turmoil and um, also uh, uh, price competition that uh, was excessive looking back because uh, they were suffering huge losses. Um, and so by uh, 2016, uh, the insurers put in, uh, two things happened. Uh, most of the insurers left except for Blue Cross uh, and the Centene, uh, now, now Centene owned uh, HealthNet product. Uh, and there were gigantic rate increases, uh, the largest in the country, uh, 50 to 75% increases. Um, and, and so suddenly Arizona went from uh, almost having a Bear County. So the first issue of Bear County uh, was in 2016 for uh, Pinal, uh, Penal, Pinal, whatever, the county that's in between Tucson and Phoenix. Um, for a while, it looked like they might not have a carrier, and, and then the, the largest increases. Uh, and so it was kind of the first sort of poster case of a market going uh, down the tubes. Uh, they got all the counties covered, uh, but now the prices uh, were, were exceptionally high. Um, and uh, But what interests me is it settled into the following pattern, that the, the two carriers, Blue Cross and uh, we'll call it Centene because it's, it's better known that way, uh, had basically split up the state. And, and Blue Cross left the urban areas that had these uh, narrow network-based products and only concentrated on the rural areas where its PPO structure uh, was uh, to its advantage. And then Centene was left you know, with the attractive markets in, in Phoenix um, and Tucson, but without any competition. Uh, and based on that, uh, rates were actually steady for 2017 uh, and 2018, I think both. Um, and and uh, uh, it seemed to have set a, kind of settled into this kind of single carrier structure uh, to companies, but dovetailing their, their, their market areas and, and sort of being willing to stay in the market uh, because they'd achieved profitability and it looked like they had kind of reached this, uh, uh, trying to use a word that doesn't invoke the antitrust uh, you know, authorities, but a, a, a strategic decisions about dovetailing their market uh, uh, coverage areas. <laughs> Which, which um, um, suggests to me that, you know, that might be sort of the stabilizing solution for some, some states. I don't know. Uh, on the other hand, it's of note that um, uh, this is a state where the two uh, startup insurers, Oscar and Bright Health, have both said we plan to enter uh, in, in 2019. And uh, that will be interesting to see if they uh, follow through on that uh, and if they do, whether... Um, that'll cause a further disruption with the established uh, insurers. So uh, a state uh, in contrast with the others, and, and again, uh, a very distinctive story uh, and one that uh, continues to unfold. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about the so-called cliff, the uh, uh, problem that arose uh, with the subsidies cutting off at 400% uh, of poverty. Uh, that is a, a really good example, I think, of an unanticipated public policy problem. Uh, there, there have been quite a few in this law, uh, but uh, this one, um, if uh, you, at, at the time the law was written, uh, it seemed reasonable uh, to uh, income test the subsidies and to gradually phase them out, and it was gradual, uh, and 400% uh, of poverty is uh, 
uh, a uh, reasonable living standard for uh, most people. Uh, and uh, so there didn't seem to be a cliff problem. Uh, but one has arisen uh, because of the increase in the premiums. What uh, I wanted to ask each of you, um, if you want, if you were asked, what do we do to fix this? Uh, what would you say? Uh, Chime in, because I, I think, in theory, there's a simple solution. Just no one pays more than ten percent, um, and um, uh, and I'm wondering what Luis thinks because it, can that be put in a way in which, you know, we're we're not subsidizing the 400 to 500. We're just saying wherever ten percent kind of meets. Uh, you know, the income level, that's where your subsidies phase out. Because that was sort of the original design, that to, to get to the phase out, you you know, given what insurance premiums were, you you needed to get up to 400. And, that, and if that phase is out at 500, 550, whatever, you're not, you're just sort of saying as a, as a general principle, no one should have to pay more than 10 percent, but you get less help, the less, the, you know, the, 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 the better off you are. Seems reasonable. What's wrong with that? So I would agree um, that structure basically covers everybody. And even with our current structure, especially a few years ago, not as common now, but we do ha there are people who earn less than 400% of the poverty level who don't get any subsidies at all because coverage is already in the affordable as a percentage of their income, even though they don't earn more than 400% of the poverty level. So if you just were to say, you know, no, like, because right now it's a lot smaller percentage than 10% of your income that you pay if you're well under 400% of the poverty level. But it's right a little below 10% if you're between 300 and 400. If we were just to say above 300%, you don't pay more than 10% of your income for the benchmark plan, you would have people in some areas who maybe get a little bit of a subsidy above 400% of the poverty level, but maybe don't get any. You would have people in other areas, like in the mountains of Colorado, you would get a premium subsidy at 1,000% um, of the poverty level um, because you would be paying you know, a family of four earning $100,000 a year in Pagosa Springs, Colorado, is paying $30,000 a year for their health insurance. So you know, whereas if they were earning $98,000 a year, you know, they'd, they'd be getting a $2,400 a month premium subsidy. So it's a you would you would cover you would sort of cast a wide net and catch everybody the the one downside to that is there isn't any sort of restriction on costs there so you by just saying we'll just here you get money and you get money and you get money you know it's like mm -hmm. you aren't doing anything to bring down the premiums you're helping things for the people who are suffering having to pay you know 30% of their income for health insurance but you're not addressing the root cause of the problem which is the cost of health care um, <clears throat> I think I think that's exactly right. Which is, you know, none of this addresses healthcare spending or costs, and to pay fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand twenty seven hundred, whatever you're a month for health insurance is kind of crazy. So I mean, something is not working. So I, I I'll just throw out a very um, maybe radical, but why not pool the individual market and um, put it out for bid? Have it be its own pool. Right now, I mean, we're still like, we're still like, it's almost, we're selling to individuals. There's no care coordination. There's no monitoring of their care. There's no disease management. It's not managed. It's just you buy insurance and you're basically, it's maybe indemnity insurance. There's no, so why don't we put it up, put it, pool it, maybe, maybe even pull it with the small group market. Say here's my 300,000 people, or Minnesota. Now it's not, they're going to kill me if they're watching. 160,000 people, <laughs> put it out for bid and have and negotiate prices for the pool, and start to do some care management and value-based purchasing and think about what you're purchasing. Um, so, and then you'd have a single carrier that won the bid. Yeah. And if you did, you did that, and yeah, that's an interesting, an interesting idea. Reactions to that. Go for it. <laughs> uh, let's go back to the uh, family in the mountain town of Colorado <laughs> that would be charged 30000 Um That's the problem of very sparsely populated uh, rural areas, and we've got a lot of those in this country. 
if you were designing a system and, uh, that uh, uh, was basically uh, sticks with the, uh, if you were amending the Affordable Care Act law, let's assume it's, it sticks there, what would you do uh, to uh, mitigate this problem of sparsely populated r rural areas? Well, one thing Colorado has actually considered is combining the whole rate in state into one rating area because we do have, you know, the bulk of our population is along the I-25 corridor, um, Denver, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, that area. But if you go into the mountains or if you go out into the eastern plains, you have much more rural areas, um, you know, fewer hospitals, there aren't as many providers, so they sort of all have to be in the network. You don't have the sort of leveraging that you get mm -hmm. in the Denver metro area. And so we have, you know, our rating areas, the rates are all over the map, really, and um, the mountains and the eastern plains are, are really high. Um, and that was, there was actually a study, Colorado did a study on should we, should we merge everybody into one rating area, and they actually came out and said no, because there just wasn't enough, so there was too much resistance to it along the populated area, because everybody there said, wait, that means our rates are going to go up to bring everybody else, to bring the rates of the lower populated areas down. And so the, the um, state, you know, stopped short of recommending that and instead recommended that we pursue other avenues to try to actually bring down the cost of care. Um, but you do have, you know, in the mountains, everything is more expensive. The, the cost of providing care is more expensive. Um, your, your overhead costs are more expensive. So un unless you, I mean, that's, I don't know, I guess that's the million dollar question, but we did consider merging everybody into one rating area and decided not to do it. And you could have done it because that is a it was the states that set up the, uh, the rating areas. Well, Mark? If I recall correctly, one thing that was in the uh, reinsurance bill that didn't uh, go, move forward, was, but I thought was a nifty idea, was to set up the reinsurance, reinsurance formula, the, the ban and the percents, such that it was more generous to the rural areas than the urban to give added rate relief to those areas. Mm -hmm. And also the state subsidy bill that they were considering would have would have only applied to people in our three most expensive rating areas um, who had to pay more than 20% of their income for health insurance. So so we have considered some targeted things to try to, to address the, the specifically those high, high cost areas, but we haven't done it yet. Well, anyway, and particularly for reinsurance, there's no given reason it has to be the same formula throughout the state. You could, you could, you could for... Uh, uh, specified reasons have have uh, varied formulae. Uh, before we throw this open to audience questions, let me ask uh, each of you to say, um, if you were in charge in your state, uh, uh, what is the most important thing you would do to stabilize the markets going forward? Well, I think yeah. I, I gave my idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I would love to see the, those two pieces of legislation pass. Um, I know funding is an issue, and I know there's, you know, it's, there's no free money, but if we could implement a reinsurance program and provide some state funding to help out the people who are a little over 400% of the poverty level, I would like to see those bills implemented. So I, I think... Um, Two very simple things. Um, simple, assuming I have you know a magic wand that can make this all happen. Um, and, and, yeah. So, so um, it would would be to end you know the um, the grandfathered and, and grandmothered plans, so we get those individuals into the marketplace um, for one, and then I think to revisit the the stopgap measure and get rid of all the things in it that weren't reinsurance and just do the reinsurance piece, which mm -hmm. seems to be successful in places like Minnesota, and I think it would be in in Iowa too. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think it would be the, the capping insurance at 10% for everybody, plus the, the thing that uh, Lynn mentioned that we heard repeatedly, which just, just leave us alone for a while. <laughs> yeah. Stop making these changes. Well, let's uh, throw this open to uh, audience questions. Um, yes, yeah, Sabrina. Thank you. This has been a great panel. Um, I have a question for Brad. I, I'm just sort of curious if you have any thoughts on whether the way Iowa did its Medicaid expansion, in other words, running that population through the exchange, had any um, 
effect, either destabilizing or, or a positive effect? That's a good question. I didn't talk about um, our Medicaid expansion at all. Um, I, um, I, I don't think um, I can tell you kind of one way or the other, other than to say I think the fact that we have the Medicaid expansion means that there are some individuals that would have been, you know, in the sort of the 100 to 138, right, that are in our Medicaid program instead of in our marketplace. Um, I mean, they, they started out in the marketplace and then they, they got moved over. Um, it started out being called uh, marketplace choice, right, and then the co-op closed down and then there was no choice. So then you had to scramble to say, okay, well, you can go into this one plan on the marketplace or you can go into traditional state Medicaid. Um, but now we've moved everybody over into managed care, um, which is, a, a, we could have another panel on a different day about that. Um, so it's, it's hard to get a read, but I think it might contribute somewhat, right? Because you've got a group of individuals at this point in time, at least, that are not in the marketplace that, that would have been. Uh, Louise, is that true in Colorado too? Because you expanded Medicaid. Yes. Um, we expanded Medicaid, but it's just straight Medicaid yeah. expansion. But yes, the people who between 100 and 138 percent of the poverty level are in our Medicaid program mm -hmm. instead of our marketplace. So. Yes, right here. And tell us who you are when you get the microphone. Uh, good morning, June O'Connell. Thank you very much. It's great to have a people representing various diverse parts of the country before us. Um, Part of the development of Affordable Care Act was that employers were uh, offering different plans in different states, and it was uneven to the extent of whether or not people were covered through their employer plan. Um, so my question to you all is, what insights do you all have into what's happened with the employer component of the markets in your various states? Um, and to what degree that reinforces the rural versus um, urban divide, whether or not private employer coverage has increased or decreased in your states, that, that sort of thing. Thank you. So, so one thing is we, we didn't really take a close look at that, although uh, we have experts in each of the states. Uh, since, since I'm not an expert in Arizona, I don't know. But uh, nationally, it, it's, it has been notable that the employer market place really has not been uh, strongly affected by the Affordable Care Act, and in particular, the small group market. So there was a lot of, most of the attention that we're discussing now, market stabilization and all, uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act, we were talking about the small group market, and, and that's the market that had all these problems and whatever, and can we fix them with, with uh, state-based small group reforms. Uh, it's it's there's been almost no mention of small group markets since the Affordable Care Act. So whatever the ACA did to that market <laughs> seemed to have been taken pretty much in stride, um, and 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 more so for the uh, large group market. That it really seems to be driven more by the overall you know economy than than uh, anything in the ACA. It'll be interesting to see though with this uh, new rule on association health plans. Uh, I think it'll have a much stronger effect on the small group market than the individual market. I think the individual market will be affected more by the short-term plans and the Farm Bureau type things. Um, so I do think we need to stay tuned on the, particularly the small group side of the employer market to see if it continues to, it's not like it's vastly better than it was before, but it doesn't seem dramatically worse either. Any other reactions to that? Um, I would say our small group market in Colorado was already, we, Colorado had actually already gone through reforms about a decade ago to, um, for community rating in the small group market. Um, the market's been stable. We haven't really seen sort of the volatility that we see in the individual market. Um, as far from a insurance brokerage standpoint, um, a lot of our big insurance carriers in Colorado have stopped paying commissions in the individual market, but they're still paying commissions in the small group market. So, and they still like, we have some insurers that have just completely eliminated their broker support staff for the individual market, but they still have a solid broker support staff for their small group market, which just kind of gives you an indication that like, they're very happy to still be selling small group plans. Um, so yeah, our small mm -hmm. group market is good. Good. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, back here in and tell us who you are. Uh, Dave Anderson, Duke University. And you all had mentioned several aspects of um, different numbers of insurers in the state. Was there any um, convergence on like the optimal number of insurers within the region, anywhere from one to eight to nine? Is some of the numbers that we heard? Like, what were your informants telling you? 
so Colorado, we have 14 counties. We have 64 counties in the state. There are 14 counties that have just one insurer. Um, that's the mountain, a lot of the areas in western Colorado. Eastern Colorado is mostly just two insurers. Um, up and down the Front Range corridor, we range from two to six. So like the Denver metro area has, most counties there have four to six. Um, so yes, it very much depends, and it's mostly correlated with population. Um, so I, I think there's a general sense that we want competition, right, in the market. Um, but that said, folks that I, I spoke with seem to indicate just having the one insurer was sufficient, right? We didn't have any bare counties, so there was an option for people. Um, and it's also, I mean, your question depends on whose perspective we're asking about, because if you're Medica, it's a really good business model. <laughs> Uh, Paul. Uh, thanks, I'm Paul Ginsberg. <clears throat> Something you said, Lynn Blewett, uh, about the uh, many of the plans of the individual market in Minnesota, <clears throat> in Minnesota are uh, kind of indemnity-like plans, very passive plans. I was under the impression, given the data on the proportion nationally of individual plans and the exchanges that are narrow network, that uh, I was under the impression this was a highly managed environments. Uh, is Minnesota unique or is that something across the country? You know, I, I, I may have used that term loosely, um, but there, I, I wouldn't say Minnesota is unique. Um, if they're narrow network, that's like the sole managed component. <laughs> and, and they're still negotiating discounted fees. A lot of our managed that's how a lot of our managed care negotiate their prices with the providers it's not it's not a capitated you know managed risk kind of profile so so that's that's what I meant it's 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 basically just paying paying the bills and not managing the care yeah hi I'm Sophia Corden I'm a high school student from Arizona actually uh, and I had a question for you uh, how do you think the large Native American population like plays into the market in Arizona? Uh, I guess and maybe for Colorado too, if you think that has any effect at all. So that that is a weakness in my coverage of, of Arizona. The, the population is is quite large, and the rules are somewhat different for them, uh, and so I don't have a good sense of that. Uh, looking, at, maybe Louise does, um. or if you do, you may let us know. Uh, <laughs> field research. Yeah. I, I'm drawing a blank on that. I really don't know. I think, and I'm, I, I, might, I might don't have notes on that in front of me, but I'm fairly sure I remember Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona was the only insurer that I saw last year in the rate filings that actually um, added the cost of CSR for Native American populations back into their premiums. In most states, that it was just sort of insurers just ate that cost. Um, but I, I'm fairly sure it was Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona that, that addressed the issue. So obviously it was going to be a, a large enough chunk of money that they added it to their rates, just like all the other states added CSR. So back here. Hey, Ellie Rizzo, Horizon Government Affairs. I'm also from Iowa City, so go Hawks. Um, I was curious, there's a lot of flexibility in what you are what you can apply for in a 1332 waiver. So I was wondering if any of you have a sense um, as to why states have, so many states have decided to pursue reinsurance as their main avenue um, in their 1332 waivers instead of another solution. Uh, I, you know, one of, the, one of the main reasons is that um, when Price was the secretary, he sent a letter to all the governors saying, pursue reinsurance. <laughs> so that was like a signal, like we're open to this. This is a way that you can finance your reinsurance or, or a high risk pool that they, they mentioned both of those options. And Alaska was the first one and they said, go look at what Alaska did. We're open to this. So I think that was, uh, that was one of the, one of the, um, that was the signal to do. Um, the, the other thing, both Alaska and Minnesota, which is kind of interesting, had already built in infrastructure from, from their high-risk pools. So they used their legislative, um, they already had legislation on high-risk pools. They just sort of morphed that into a reinsurance, and they used their infrastructure. So we already had a, had a high-risk pool board and a high-risk pool entity. It was already organized. And so, so that was another reason. It was like we could build on existing infrastructure, and I think that's why Alaska and Minnesota were out first 
first is that we already had some some base basis to go go for yeah Maine's another state that had a reinsurance infrastructure in place that's uh, likely to restart it uh, soon uh, w one key reason in, in, in addition to what Lynn said is just the math works under 1332 so the guardrails that uh, uh, Brad mentioned uh, say that the state can redistribute the money as long as no one's worse off so it, you know the, the economist would have to say would say it had to be Pareto optimal no one worse off and some people better off and it's hard to produce that if you just say we're going to take that and do the subsidies differently because somebody will get less subsidy and then, and then you don't meet the but reinsurance uh, has the sort of magic quality that uh, the Len was describing where if if you can uh, you know reduce mar uh, rates market wide then uh, th that frees up otherwise subsidy monies that can be put into reduce, reducing rates more market wise, and, and it doesn't go on forever. It reaches a new equilibrium, but it 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 it, it you sort of our uh, uh, money materializes out of thin air, sort of quality. Right, we can take one more question. Excuse me. We can take one more question, uh, and then uh, you've all earned a coffee break. Uh, let me go uh, over here. Hi, uh, I'm Victor Sweezy. I'm a high school student from Los Angeles. And I was just wondering, um, so uh, under the last couple of years under the Trump administration, there's obviously been a decrease in funding and focus on um, promotion uh, during the enrollment period. Um, yet, I know in a lot of states, enrollment has stayed pretty uh, 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 stable or increased. So I was just wondering um, what strategies for promoting uh, enrollment have worked in the past and what are some strategies that you all um, will be focusing on in the future to keep enrollment up? Good question. Okay, I can start out on that. And, and, and California is notably not one of our study states, partly because it has been profiled a, a good bit uh, to a large extent by itself uh, <laughs> because they're proud of their, their success. But they should be. Uh, and they have a study out showing uh, that there's a very favorable uh, return on investment in, in more advertising. Not only do you enroll more people, but you enroll healthier people. Uh, and you get more new enrollees, which is important to keeping uh, the risk pool uh, fresh because over time a risk pool tends to, to, to degrade. Um, and so uh, they have good reports, uh, you know, uh, establishing that. Uh, the other thing is that in, in our study states, we saw even the states that uh, were federally, best exchange, federally based exchanges like um, Florida, which has a very high take up, uh, one of the highest uh, rates of sign up and, and as a result, a, a larger uh, enrollment pool than even California because they did not expand Medicaid, so they have more eligible people. Uh, it's, it's due in large part to local um, uh, community organizations that are very uh, committed uh, to this cause. Uh, now to, previously, those were supported also by federal grants for navigators and assisters, but uh, Maine's another state where uh, we heard that uh, there was just a lot of local support for those type of outreach uh, embedded organizations. Uh, a good number of them connected either with legal aid or with uh, community health centers. Uh, yeah. Other reactions, uh, Brad? I can chime in and say I think it would be a great idea for us to do some outreach and enrollment um, in the state of Iowa. Um, <laughs> I, um, in Mark's report, which you all should read, it's it, there. I was it was interesting, um, and I don't know which state or where where this was, but it that 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 just the constant sort of ACA and and the barrage from the national level, all the you know we're going to repeal and replace that actually had an impact of bringing people into the market because people are, were aware of it. So it's sort of like that that earned unearned media, which was kind of interesting to me. Like it's still on the you know it's on the top. It wasn't like outreach enrollment strategy, but just that 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 it was part of the news cycle was kind of interesting to keep people aware. Oh, that's that's Mincher, or you know, I, what is that, and how do I go about that? So I think I think um, I think states are going to have to step up and do their own enrollment and outreach, and I would imagine the insurers are going to too, especially for those who are m making a ton of money right now on the su subsidized market. Yes, they have every reason to. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and uh, join me now in thanking these panelists for their. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.